There's a phrase that has become pretty popular lately, at least in my circles. It's slang, so watch your ears, you know, you might get a little offended by imperfect English. But the phrase is that life is lifing. Anybody ever heard anything like that before? Some, some people say life be lifing. Well, life is lifing. What does that mean? It means that you're in a rutch, rough patch of life. That everything can, that life can throw at you seems to be happening at the same time. Someone dies, a job is lost, a bad diagnosis, the car is broken into, a relationship ends, you lose some money, the groceries are high, traffic jam always seems to to catch you, the kids are sick, you're sick, the flight's delayed, a bad report, politics are maddening and suspicious and dividing, you're get, you get the idea, life is lifing. Adulting means caring for multiple matters at once and sometimes those multiple matters don't go well all at the same time. Some of us say, when they say, how you doing? You say, life is lifing. And we get the point. And, and let me not make light of this because life has been full for many of us, if not all of us, full of some unsettling matters that can take their toll. There's so much going on in our lives, so much going on here at the church, so much going on in our city, in our country, in our world. The reality is that we are all impacted one way or another. And whether we realize it or not, the once in a lifetime pandemic took its toll on us and changed the way of life for many of us. And is still impacting us in very tangible ways. What do you do when life seems to throw everything at you at once and you're tired and frustrated and you need a break? You need a break and a breakthrough. You need something to go well for you. You might just crack and sometimes we don't even know that's the state we're in. We don't understand how stressed and stretched we really are. Does the Bible help us at all to manage, to survive, and to thrive in this life? Does it help us thrive individually, and does it help us thrive as a church? Well, I believe today's scripture covers both because it's centered on none other than the disciple Peter. Peter, one of the most well-known disciples because he's outspoken and he's close to Jesus, he's committed to Jesus and usually front and center with Jesus. He has deep conversations with Jesus, including the conversation recorded in Matthew 16 when Jesus prophetically says to Peter, and I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell or Hades will not prevail against it. Yet life was still lifing, and while Peter promised Jesus that he would not deny him during the passion of Christ, he did deny him three times. And now his friend Christ has been crucified, and Peter is no doubt distraught. Fast forward, this is the same Peter who post-resurrection starts the church in the book of Acts, just as Jesus said he would. So somehow Peter went from tragedy and trauma to triumph. And his story therefore offers guidance on how to go from trauma to triumph individually and in the church. Peter, in a sense, represents both. With today's knowledge of mental health, we can be sure that at this point in the biblical text, Peter and the disciples were traumatized following the crucifixion. And Peter may have even been depressed. How do you go from trauma to triumph when life is still lifing? Some of us know that life never stops lifing until it does. Get that when you get home.
How do you get from trauma, from trauma and tragedy when life is lifing and you're busy and stressed and you're literally dealing with pain and grief and life won't let up? Well, you could do what Peter did. Peter went fishing. Any fishers in the house? Any fisher women or fishermen? Oh, hi, Park Union, we got to go fishing. Let's go to the text. Verse 2 says, gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. Keep it in context. This is post-crucifixion. Jesus has appeared once to them in a, in a locked room, according to the prior chapter. Peter said, I'm going fishing. And they said, all those disciples that were named, we'll go with you. Peter, in this moment of trauma, decides to do that which he does best, fishing. That which he was doing regularly before Jesus came along. We wish we could get in Peter's head. Was this a sign that Peter felt that the Jesus episode in his life was over? In the midst of trauma, after so much hope in Jesus, and now he's been crucified, even though, per the prior chapter, he appeared to the disciples, I can hear Peter saying, this is too much, I'm out. I'm going fishing. In a sense, he returned to that which was familiar to him. And sometimes what is familiar and that which we believe we're good at is our default in the midst of trauma. After all, fishing can be relaxing, and if you're good at it, and you catch many fish, the body does what it does when we win. There's a large release of dopamine and testosterone, and the reality is we feel better. What is your go-to? That thing that you're good at, thinking about my son on his birthday, for him it's bowling. He stays in that bowling alley more than any place. It makes them feel better. What is your go-to that you say, I'm going blank? We are fearfully and wonderfully made, and doing what you're good at might help you feel better and begin to heal your trauma in times of sadness and trauma. So figure out what you're good at, and sometimes when you're low and lowly, do that thing. Here's another tip. Whatever it is, don't do it alone. As Peter says in 3.1, I'm going fishing. His friend said, we'll go with you. Following the crucifixion, the biblical stories tell us of the disciples being together. They remained in community. At least most of the stories tell us that, yes, there are times when we're dealing with trauma that we just want to be left alone. But there's a true benefit in sometimes being with others. Be in community. See, with the pandemic, we all had to shelter in place. And since then, it's been reported that there is almost an epidemic of isolation. So I encourage you, be in community. Be with friends with friends, with people who care about us. That's healthy. How do we get from trauma to triumph? Spend time with friends. And if you have a friend who's like Peter, who's really struggling, offer to spend time with them. Be a friend and you'll have some friends. And friends can help you make it through from trauma to triumph. After all, the disciples were suffering too. They, they wanted to be together. They needed community too, and no doubt they looked up to Peter. So they wanted to be with him in this time of confusion for them all. So Peter and his friends go fishing. And the text, in verse 3 says that they went out, they got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. I don't know, Peter was like, life is life and again. For even what Peter 
does well doesn't this time go well. That night, likely different from other nights, they caught nothing. It seems that the fish weren't biting. Have you ever felt like Peter likely felt that the fish weren't biting in your life? Peter was a fisherman and the fish weren't biting. At this moment, life is lifing and it looks like problems on the job or in the profession or even just what you love to do. Your favorite pastime is simply not working for you. Is it possible that God uses those times to get our attention as part of the process from trauma to triumph. I've seen God do it. It's a pivotal point in Peter's life, for it's the point where Jesus enters the story. Just after daybreak, verse 4 says, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? Almost sounds like Jesus set that up, but that just came to me now. You have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. I believe with all my heart that the divine engages our lives. Sometimes in response to prayer, sometimes because God is intimately aware the Spirit is with us and walks with us and talks with us and orders our steps and helps us navigate life. And the divine engaged Peter and his friends in this moment. They did not know it was Jesus. Often we don't know when it's the divine speaking to us. The divine may not be recognizable, but the divine knew there was a problem and sent the disciples instructions. Sometimes when we're traumatized, tired, weary, stressed, and hurting, instruction comes, guidance comes, help comes, and we miss it. We've all had times in life when we wanted to do it our way, and, and we were unwilling to hear our parents' instructions. Am I by myself or is somebody with me? Or we have children today who were trying to tell them the right way to go, do this. And they resist with all their might. In this case, it's Peter and fishing is his jam, right? So, so to take instruction from a stranger on the shore could have been a little hard to take. Sometimes we're too tired, too overwhelmed, and too stubborn to hear the instructions that come, and we miss it. Peter and the disciples didn't miss it, and the text says that they cast their net on the other side. And now they were, they were not able, the text says, to haul in all the fish because there were so many. Verse 7 says, that disciple who loved Jesus said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard it, it was the Lord, he, he put on his outer garment and he jumped in the sea and no doubt started swimming towards Jesus. That dopamine and testosterone hit Peter when all those fish came. He got inspired and he took off in the water. Before we move too fast into the celebration of the abundance of fish, let's not miss the step of trauma to triumph. Peter and the other disciples in the midst of their trauma and now their disappointment, no fish, listened when the instruction came and were humble enough to follow the instructions. They didn't miss the triumph, this win, because they were humbled enough to listen, especially in the midst of trauma. Sometimes we can't think straight. Sometimes we're too weary and God will send instruction for our lives. And just as the disciples, you might not recognize the divine. Remain humble, remain in community, and go towards triumph by being humble enough to follow instruction. Now the story gets even better. So Peter, full of dopamine and testosterone, when he hears it, jumps in the water and swims to Jesus. And verse 9 says, 
When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. I heard this text preached years and years ago by Reverend Granger Browning of the AME Church from another state, and he was at a conference here in Chicago, and he titled the sermon, When the Fish Ain't Biting, God's Got Something Cooking. I never forgot it. I actually ran into him last year at the Rainbow Push clergy breakfast. He was here, I believe he's out of Texas, and I went up to him and told him, I, you preached a sermon, and his eyes got big, like, how do you know that? And I said, because it never left me. I'm amazed when I look at this text, and Jesus has fish on the shore already. He's cooking exactly what they were trying to get, but the fish weren't biting so sometimes when the fish are not biting in our lives, God's got something cooking. Say amen. Thank you. Peter and the disciples get to shore. The one who gave the instruction on how to catch the fish was already at the shore cooking fish. The divine knew what they needed because the divine already had it. Trust God when things get tough. Don't only trust, stay close to God. See, many people leave God when things get hard. They lay down their church fellowship and their church membership, and they say, I'm going to do this life thing without that, without God. Thank God that God doesn't do that to us. Trust God when the need, Hyde Park Union Church, is great, but the fish aren't biting. And we're not sure how we're going to get it all done. Trust God, Hyde Park Union Church, when we're trying to figure out what to do next. Great meeting last week over the multiple options. Trust God when, when we're not sure but we're making decisions that will impact the next generations to come. Trust God because when we went fishing, we caught a landmark building. Amen. Trust God because now the work continues. You see, the catch of fish was an intermediary win for Peter. God had something greater for Peter to do. You see, the catch of fish got Peter's dopamine flowing, awakened his spirit. He went from, I'm going fishing, to swimming the shore to see Jesus. Began to heal his trauma. That intermediary wind helped Peter. He felt his help coming and he says, okay, let's, let's do this. And we see Peter begin to transform from tragedy and trauma to triumph right before our very eyes. Because Peter went to do what was familiar to him. He went to do something that might make him feel better. Peter did so in community with friends. He did so with friends who walked with him and needed to be in community with him. Peter went from tragedy and trauma to triumph because he listened and in the midst of his trauma and no doubt his frustration after the fishing all night long and catching nothing, Peter somehow remained humble and did what the divine said and he and the disciples caught a boatload of fish. They got an intermediary win and they felt better. Peter went from tragedy and trauma to triumph because he had a major breakthrough and, and right the, at the, just at the right time. And now he's with Jesus. He's encouraged because he's caught the fish. He feels better. He's even inspired because of the fish. And now after the celebration and the breakthrough, verse 15 says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, remind him where he came from, and said, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. 
Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. That last move of moving from tragedy and trauma to true triumph is to allow yourself to be reoriented for service. Jesus now having an inspired Peter Healing from trauma of life that has been lifing has given Peter the fish he was looking for. Ask Peter a poignant question. Do you love me more than you love these, these disciples, these fish? I'd venture to say Jesus was referring to the boatload of fish, the intermediary wind, and Peter answers affirmatively, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus says, feed my lambs. Those who know this part of the story know that Jesus asked him two more times. Peter actually was a little disturbed. Jesus, why do you keep asking me? I, I love you. I only needed to see it once to hear the Spirit speaking to me and to us. We've had a Peter experience. We just had a great, great win with the city council vote to landmark our church building, exterior, and sanctuary. And this is so very exciting for so many of us, for those who have stayed over the years and watched the congregation decrease in number and have wondered what will happen to the church. This is a pivotal moment. For those who have so many memories of different spaces in the church, childhood memories, even to the architecture, this is a blessed moment. For those who know the architecture intimately, treasure the space and value the construction and the history associated with this edifice in this location at this point in history, this is an inspiring accomplishment. And no doubt the divine knows right where we are in history. And I gently walk in this space to lean towards the meaning of it all. Jesus is saying, do you love me more than these? Feed my sheep. Remember our mission to celebrate God's diversity among us through inclusive, open, and affirming Christian fellowship and service to welcome and honor each person through all stages of life and to pursue God's justice in the world with the promise of joy, liberation, and love. No doubt this edifice will aid us as we seek to do our mission. Remember the mission and use this moment to be reinvigorated for service. There's no better time in history to recommit as a church to reach the masses to the best of our ability to share the good news of Jesus Christ. God's sheep are hungry for truth. God's sheep are hungry for love and liberation, hungry for healing. God's sheep need to be inspired and cared for and affirmed. God's sheep need to be fed. In Hyde Park Union Church, this moment in our history, God is indeed calling us to feed God's sheep. Let's move from triumph to the next triumph in community together. Amen.